five, perfect.
you right now, Ron, let me just ask for God that you would reverse the effects of that stroke. And then praying to figure out a way to do a pathway for God. You'd be able to restore the sight that's paralyzed.
exciting to be together, eh? Yeah. And uh, we have in attendance today, our first service back, we have 34 people here, all practicing social distancing in their own groups, so we're glad that, that you were able to come, and glad for those that are able to watch us online through live streaming as well. You know, uh, sometimes, as we've been saying this morning, uh, Things are taken away from us, and we didn't want them taken away from us, but one of them was community, the community dynamic and aspect of church. And uh, I know we all valued community and church beforehand, at least a lot of us did, most of us, but when it's taken from you, it brings that reality home. And so as we have communion this morning, uh, let's just really allow that value to really enhance not only our experience today, but moving forward as we come out of COVID to think about the significance and importance of community and of our relationships with each other that we really go forward, perhaps even more valuing it because we lost it for a while. I, you know what I mean? Like we lost that connection to a certain extent. And so what a blessing, eh? Like, I mean, in the worship services, I was just giving thanks. The Lord, this is so good. We're together. You know, I, you know, I just, that's what I was, that was, that's what I was doing. So, I thought this was a wonderful way to celebrate. And so today, we have the bread, and we have our juice before us here. And so, if you would, with me, I'll lead us through communion. And so, at the Last Supper, rather than reading the scripture, I'll just tell a story. At the Last Supper, Jesus was with his, his 12 disciples. And uh, they were having Passover. And Jesus revealed to them what Passover was really about. That Passover, when it was instituted many years before, was a picture, a symbol, that spoke prophetically to the fact that Jesus was going to die on the cross. And Jesus said, I'm here now. And I am, I am the Lamb. And when you hold the juice, it's my blood that's about to be spilled on the cross. When you hold the bread, it's my body that's about to be broken on it. And so he said, you take the bread and give thanks as often as you read, as often as you shake it, and same with the blood. So before we do, we're just going to pray together. Um, uh, we're just going to pray together that the Lord will make this real to us again. So Lord, we come to you today. And firstly, Lord, we give you thanks for community. We give you thanks for the family. Thank you, Lord, that we are united by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the life of Jesus Christ. Thank you today that we can be together. And we think for all of our friends that are part of this group, uh, bless them today in their homes. They can't be here today. And those that are joining us, because we have friends from Down Island, we have friends from the Lower Mainland, we have friends across BC and other places that are connecting with us in Alberta. Lord, bless them today in a great way. And so, Lord, today again, as we take the bread and as we take the juice, Lord, we pray that the reality of your finished work on the cross, what you did, would touch us again. And so we hold the bread today and we say thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying on the cross. Let's take the bread and we give thanks. After they had their meal, Jesus took the cup. He said, this is the blood speaks of my blood which is given for you that your sins are being forgiven. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. A little later on this morning, uh, you know, after the service, we'll shut the faith, we'll shut off the live stream and if anybody would like prayer, uh, please feel free to come up. Miles and I were saying, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have prayer afterwards? And 
So we're very open to that, right? And we'd like to do that. Was, was there anything else, Miles, we have to do? Or, no? We're good? Okay. Please come up. Pray for me. Anything else? <clears throat> Dan and, and Dan said, you know, I've been thinking about speaking on this for, for a month. And he said, do, do you think you've already spoken on it? Should I, should I, uh, you know, find something else? And we all said, oh, go for it. You know, that's wonderful. That's just a confirmation that that's a current word for, for what, what we're sensing right now. So then Dan preached to that last week as well. And I so enjoyed his message. I, I wasn't here, of course, I took a week off of holidays, but later in the week I got to listen to his message, and I really appreciated the points and the thoughts that uh, uh, Dan brought to our attention about calling. I felt, however, that I needed to continue on and, and, and address it some more. And when I met again with the guys uh, when we were talking, we just all sensed that, that there's something here that God is calling all of us, right? And so as we come back together, we are still out in our world. And uh, we gain strength by being together. But we are called into our world. And so the story I'd like to tell you uh, and, and take from is from Exodus chapter 3. And in Exodus chapter 3, it tells the story of Moses and how Moses was called. And I, I thought that would be a good example at this stage to, to look at. And so I want to talk about how Moses was called, using that as an example that you also are called. All right? Now, again, I just want to state before I get into my message, at the end, uh, if you do want prayer, we would love to pray for you. And as I said, we'll, we'll be finishing the live streaming, and so you're welcome to come up at that time and, and have prayer. We would just love to kind of connect in that way, so anyone would love that, you're welcome to, to join us at that point. That being said, so I want to talk to you about calling today. And so in Exodus chapter 3, verse 1, we find these words. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. 
And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Let's drop down to the ninth verse for the sake of time. Verse 9. And now the cry of the Israelites, and now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now, Moses was definitely called. I don't think anybody would object to that. Looking at his life, the way it went. Moses, however, if we look at the story and think about the moment in his life when, Jesus, when God said this to him, Moses was not looking for his calling. Right? He was not. He, was, he had become comfortable in the obscurity of being in another location. He had been comfortable, he had become comfortable serving his family. He had become comfortable connecting with his father-in-law Jethro. He had become comfortable being a father. And what's wrong with that? That's all good stuff. Right? That's part of the problem anyway. Right? Sure. God wants us to connect with our families and our spouses and all of that, right? But I don't think he was looking at it that way. He was comfortable within the obscurity of not fulfilling the dream on his heart. And you know, often our dreams do line up with our calling, by the way. His dream had been to see Israel delivered. That was his dream. But now 40 days have gone by and he's become comfortable in this place where he was. He had suppressed and was suppressing the inner calling upon his life of what God wanted to do through him. He was suppressing that. You know, you're not going to come into deeper levels of freedom in the spirit and revelations of what the Lord has for you and seeing God in new ways, if you suppress the calling that is upon your life. Moses finally responded to God, as we're going to look at, and moved into his calling, and look how he saw God. Holy, wow, like crazy stuff, you know, that took place, right? And he, and he would just be baffled and overwhelmed. God says, stretch out the staff. And all of a sudden, you know, the Red Sea just goes. He's like, whoa, I never knew that would happen. You know, like, God, it's pretty amazing, right? And all the different things that went on, right? He saw God in ways he would not have seen him if he had not responded to what God had called him to do. And that's true in all of our lives. So I want to talk about that. The point is that, as we've been saying, is all of us are called. It is not just... A few people that are called. It's not just the Moseses that are called. It's all of us that are called to our world. We are the missionaries to our world in that sense. You are called. Now let's look at a couple of verses. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 and the 11th verse says this. Second Thessalonians 1 verse 11. So we keep on praying for you. Second Thessalonians 1 verse 11. I'm hearing papers ruffle. I'm just so excited. <laughs> I was looking, I was thinking it was happening virtually all this past 15 months, you know. Just so good. Anyway, what was I talking about? Second Thessalonians 1 verse 11, it says, 
So we keep on praying for you, asking our God to enable you to live a life worthy of his call. That's what Paul said to all the believers in the church in Thessal, Thessal, Thessalonians, the Thessalonian church. He, he, said to them, he said to them, we are praying that God will help you to live in your calling. Paul said, that's one of my praying, is that you would discover that and live in your calling. Now let's look at one more. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Again, I'm just trying to build a case, biblically and scripturally, for what we already know in our spirits that God is speaking to us about, that this just wasn't for Moses and the Apostle Paul and a few other people, but it's for all of us that we are all called into our own world. Amen. Ephesians 4, 1. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Isn't that something? I urge you. So the first one was, I pray that you will know your calling. Now Paul is saying, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. That you'll step into that. That you'll fully move into that. He says, I urge you, go for it. He's saying. And so I, I really want to urge you as God's children to move beyond Senses of inadequacy. Feelings of fear. The scars and disappointments of failure. Moses struggled. And we're going to look at the five different things he said to God as he began to try and unpack in the presence of God all the fears and the failures and the senses of inadequacies that he had to do what God called him to do. It wasn't easy for Moses. And to be honest, anyone moving into their calling can feel uneasy or inadequate. You are not alone. From Moses all the way through, we're all in the same boat because we recognize the internal significance of who we represent. And we don't want to mess it up. But you are called. God's got his hand on you and he knows you can do it. So I, I, I want us to, as Paul would urge you to step up and to experience God in ever refreshing and fresh ways by moving into that and by accepting that. Calling is such a beautiful word. The calling of God on your life. Calling means this. Calling is to serve where God wants me to be. That's calling. Calling, as Dan said last week, calling is to tell others what God is all about. Remember he said that last week. I listened to it three times. I'm sure I quoted it. Um, calling is telling others what God is all about. And that is part of our calling. Our calling is, calling is not just to be with people, but it's being with people within the reality of we are his you know, as, as God leads us, we're, we're trying to connect, help people connect the dots, right, Dan? Yeah. So that's 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 good. A further thing that I've said before, and that that I will say again today, is that it, calling is to recognize that God has sent you, or He's sending you, and so that I read that, and I emphasize. If you're listening to me when I read the, the text today, I I actually highlighted or you know, really the inflection of voice went up when I said the word sending. He said to Moses, I'm sending you. So calling is to recognize that the Spirit is sending you and He has sent you. Calling, further calling, and I said this a couple weeks ago, calling is to recognize where He's sending you. Yeah. Now that comes at us in layers, and it could look different different seasons of our lives. Well, maybe that's another whole message. It looks different for me now than it did 10 years ago because of where I'm at. But still, 
That's because God is the current voice. He is the current voice of God that speaks to us in the current reality of where we live, in the current circumstances that we live, in the current world that we live, right? Excellent. So we need to recognize that too. Moses. So here's Moses. Here we go. So here's Moses, and he gives five objections. We're going to look at all five objections to his calling. Now let's not put Moses way up. I mean, you look at this guy, and I mean, I mean, I mean, it's it's easy for us to elevate him so to the point that we can't even we can't even identify with him. I mean, he saw the fiery finger of the living God right, you know, down on tablets of stone, the commandments. I mean, how can I relate to that? You know, he he went up the mountain and it was on fire and it, the earth shook and. Millions of people, or, you know, all this stuff is going on with him. You think, you know, so so we put him in a whole other category, but but we shouldn't really. We should recognize that just as you are trying to figure out what God has in your life, or or, or be reaffirmed in that calling, Moses was made of the same flesh and the same blood and the same humanity as you are within the context of his life. Isn't that right? And so. He, he brings these five objections to the Lord. Now, I don't think he just made them up on the spot. We're going to read them. I'm thinking that he had spent the last 40 years thinking of these five things. And finally now, God appears to him in the burning bush. And so he begins to, to just, within that sense of security and overwhelmingness of the presence of God, says... Because God just puts his finger on says, I called you to Israel. And so he starts unpacking with God why he couldn't do it. Right? And if we're honest, you know, we all have those things where we say, well, I, I, I don't know if I can do that. Right? How do my life looks? But the point is, so, so let's go through them and see how they relate to us today. Because, see, God, God has called you to your world. God has called you to your people. Yeah, God has called you into this part of the world, you know, and, and, and you get to be Jesus with skin on in your world, right? Bring hope and encouragement, whatever that looks like, to people around you. So, so, so let's look at it. So Exodus chapter 3, verse, verse 11 is the first objection that Moses brings. Exodus 3, verse 11. But Moses, and then someone starts with a but, eh? <laughs> But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? So God says, You're going to go to Egypt, bring the people up. But who am I? Now, let's look at that. Moses is saying to God, I am very aware of my limitations. I'm very aware of my limitations. You know, sometimes you got to live a little. To discover more about what those limitations are in your life. Or sometimes you go through a few failures and then you discover your, your limitations. You think you know them when you're 20, or you think you know them when you're 15, but after you live the Lord, all of a sudden that reality can hit you a lot more. He really, really, really knew something about his limitations. Who am I? You know, don't you remember what I did 40 years ago? You know, you know, like, like, you know, I, I, I mean, he murdered somebody. Right? He murdered somebody. He killed an Egyptian. Because he was trying to make himself God's deliverer, so they let God lead him into being the deliverer. He was aware of that. But whatever those, and the point is, in, in your life as well, see, whatever that looks like for you, you face limitations in which you say, well, who am I to do that? Who am I? And, and the Lord's response is so simple and yet so profound because the Lord said to him, I'll be with you. I will be with you. We can look at Joshua as another example of calling. Joshua, chapter 1, 
He's been spending time with the Lord, and now he moves into Joshua, and he moves into a new phase of his life, and now he's the leader of Israel, and he is the commanding general giving oversight over the nation of Israel. Moses has gone on to be with the Lord. He's been taken, and he's going over into the promised land. Before him soon is, is the battles of Jericho and Ai and all the other places that crossing the Jordan River and all that. And the Lord calls him, and in Joshua chapter 1, verse 3, he says to him, I will give you every place where you set your foot. That is an example for us today. That, what does that verse mean? That verse is referring to Joshua. If you're going to read that verse and look at that as a promise in your life, take it the right way. That, that is saying to Joshua, I have called you to a certain place and a certain position and purpose in this nation and into that what I've called you to go into the land of promise in Canaan. He says, every place, and so with that in mind, he says, I'll give you a place where you set your foot. I take that verse and I apply it in my life, but I do it in the basis of how I'm called. And so God has called me to be a chaplain. God has called me to be a pastor. God has called me... And so I take it that way, and I say, Lord, I believe your promises to me is you'll give me every place where I set my foot. You call me to step there, you're there, you know? And then, and then God begins to describe to him the spheres of what that looks like. He says to him, where, where his calling would take him? He says in the fourth verse of Joshua chapter 1, he says, he says, your territory will extend. He begins to unpack it. And, and God will do that. But he won't do that till we're ready. And I am glad. God called me to be a pastor. We became a pastor. I was 20 years old. And I am so glad that he didn't tell me all that what that meant. <laughs> At that moment. You know what I'm saying? Right? But he told me what I needed to know and as much as I could get a hold of that time in my life. Isn't that right? Same with Joshua. He says, I'll give you every place where you set your foot. And when he was ready to hear some more, Lord says, this is what that looks like. Right? Isn't God gracious? Isn't he amazing? And so the first objection that he had was, who am I? And we all ask that in our lives. Come on. We all ask that. Sooner or later, we'll ask that. Who, who, who am I? Like, and then, then he comes on again. And, and the Lord answers that one. Well, I got another one. He says to him, he says to him this, he said, well, Lord, since we're talking, what's your name? Exodus 3, verse 13, when he says this, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And so Moses anticipates being asked a question that he can't, can't, cannot answer. Now, who's been there? I have. Well, if I go there and I'm in that situation, and if this happens, how am I going to respond to that? Or if this happens, how am I going to respond to that? Or, or what question? Or I wonder what the questions are going to be, because I don't know how. You know, our, our minds can get racing and thinking about things. Well, Moses is like that. He's in the presence of God. And he's thinking, well, what if I go? Sure, okay. You call me to go when I go. But what if they ask, well, what do I say to them when they say, well, who, who, who sent you? And Jesus responds, for it was a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says this in the 14th verse. He says this, I am who I am. Tell him, I am that I am. Tell them, I am sent you. And in that revelation, at that moment to Moses, which was to be unpacked to the leaders and the elders of Israel, the people of Israel, was this. I am sent you. The self-existent one has sent you, the one who was, the one who is, and the one who will always be the same. He is the one. 
I am the faithful one. I am the dependable one. I am the current one. I am the historical one. I am the one of the God of tomorrow, as well as today, as well as yesterday. Now, in the place you're called, you can feel similarly. You can think, what is your name? You can be thinking, you know, the place that you're called to, you can feel similar. Moses is thinking about where God wants him to go. But the point is, he is the I am. What's that mean? He's already there. He's already there. Whatever he's called you to, whatever position he wants you to take on, whatever, he's already in that moment. He's already there. You are stepping into a place where he already is there. And when you step into that place where he already is, then you will be revealed to who he is within that reality. Does that make sense? Because that's what it is. The Holy Spirit will give you the words when you need them. That's what the scripture says. You don't need to know now because you're not there now. Right? You have to trust, though, that he has prepared you for that moment through the experiences of your life and the files that he has placed within you and the experiences that he can help you unpack the right file, the right course, the right job, the right experience with your kids, whatever, that he will unpack that. And if that's not in the bank, you can still trust God that he'll give you something supernatural at that moment. But you don't need to know right now. Because you're not there right now. <clears throat> and so here's Moses. And that's what God so often does. He says, who, who do I say? So he answers more than the one question. He says, Moses, what you're really asking is you don't know what they're going to ask you. So you don't know how to respond to that. So here you go. Just tell them, it's I am. And to you I'm saying, I am. I am all. I am all. It's okay, I am. I've got it for you. I am there in that moment. Praise the Lord. And so he goes on. He says, well, he's still got more, right? He's, I mean, he's been chewing on this for years, right? And, you know, he's, 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 he's hurting. He's suppressing all of this. And, 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 and you know, so to the point that he can't look into what God wants to do. See, God's got stuff, but it's amazing how complex our brains get, you know? I mean, we, how we count ourselves out of, Whatever it is, you know, but the place in the world that God wants us to represent him. And so then he goes on and he says in Exodus chapter 4, verse 1 through 3, he says this. He says, uh, he said, what, what if they do not believe me? See? So Exodus 4, verse 1 to 3, I'm going to read it. Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And he said, a staff. And the Lord replied, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he, and he ran from it. I'm going to get back to that in a minute, but that's interesting. But look, what is it? He says, what if they do not believe? What if? What if? What if? You can drive yourself nuts with the what ifs, right? What if? That being said, done. Bring your what ifs to God. You can bring your what ifs to God. You can bring them to God because He'll help you. So Moses brought his what ifs finally to God in a way in, in that experience at the burning bush. And God decided in His grace, which He does, to give him three confirmations and three signs. And you know what? God's so good. You're struggling with your calling, tell Him. You're struggling, you don't want to do it. Just talk to him. Let him confirm it to you. Let him encourage you. Let him, you know, we believe in prophecy. God will bring a prophetic word or verse. Or, 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 or there's so many ways that God will tell you if your heart is open. And now what's happening to Moses is his heart is opening, you see. His heart is opening in the presence of God. So now God can say, okay, now we can talk. And he's sharing with him and he's and he's releasing him. And so God gives Moses three signs. For Moses. 
And, and so the first one was a rod. Throw your rod down on the ground. And, and, and he did, and it became a snake. And he says, I'll pick it up from the table, right? It'll become a rod again. So that was the first sign. He said, don't believe that. Try this one. Take your hand, put it in your cloak. Now bring it out. And it, and it was white as leprous as snow. That must have been scary. Then, then, he, then, then he says, now put it back in, in your rope. Bring it out again. And it was all clean. It was normal. He says, if they don't believe the first, they'll, they may, he said, they may believe the second. Isn't that interesting? I would have preferred if he said, they will believe, right? But they may, what's this may stuff, right? You know, may believe. But then, he, but that's because God had a third thing to say. He said, if those don't work, then do this. Go down the Nile. Get some water out of the Nile. Bring, bring it over to those people and pour it out. And I'll turn the water of the Nile into blood. And if they don't believe in the first second, they'll believe in the third. Isn't God gracious? God will give us confirmation. Isn't it interesting? In this story, excuse me, we find that the Lord says to this, this question to Moses, back to question, and the Lord will do that. It's a coaching thing, I guess. <laughs> anyway, he says, he said to him, so what's in your hand? So what's in your hand? Isn't that an interesting question that God said? He says, he says to him, what if they don't believe me? And then the Lord turns around and said, so what's in your hand, Moses? What was in his hand? It was a staff. And it's in Exodus chapter 4, verse 2, if you're looking at it. Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? It was just a staff. It was just a staff. And, and we can get like that. God will ask us what is in our hand. Or we'll say to ourselves, well, I don't have much in my hand that I can offer to do what you've called me to do. I don't have much that I can put before you. But the point is, see what God did with a staff. See what God did with a stick. If we take what we have, whether we think it's a lot or a little, or we think it's just a stick, a shepherd's crook, if we'll place it before the Lord, you got more than you need. You need everything. It's all you need. But I don't have the goods. You know, sometimes I think God gives us not just all the goods we need, but he intentionally, when he formed us and created us, left a few spots that he didn't give to us in our natural talent and ability so that we knew we'd need him. Because if we had all the goods, why would we see God in prayer and get on our face before him for the presence of God? You know, there's something to that. And so here he is. He places it before the Lord. All we need to do is take what we got and just give it to the Lord. Jesus only requires what I have. Jesus only requires what I have. It's all I need. All you need is who you are. That's it, guys. Well, Moses isn't done yet. He's been thinking about this for a long time. So he has another thought to bring to the Lord in a burning bush. He says this in Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. You know, Lord, I'm not very eloquent. You know, I can't speak very good. And, and look at it, Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. But Moses pleaded with the Lord, Oh, Lord, I'm not very good with words. I, listen to this, I never have been, I'm reading the New Living Translation, I never have been, and I'm not now. Even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue-tied, and my words get tangled. And I tell you, that speaks to so many of us. You know, we, we feel, well, Lord, you know, I don't know if I could step in to represent you in my world, because I don't think I'm very eloquent. I don't know. I, if I can get the right words, then we get all tongue tied and we just get quiet, you know, and we, whatever. That's what Mo Moses was in the same spot. But isn't it interesting that though he said that, 40 years before that, we find in Acts chapter 7, verse 22, that the Spirit of God reveals what happened 40 years before that in Moses' life when he was a younger man. It says Moses was educated in Acts chapter 7, verse 22. It says that Moses was educated 
in all the wisdom of Egypt and was powerful in speech and action. And yet now he is 40 years later. He says, I get all tongue tied. I can't speak. I'm not a powerful speaker. I'm not very eloquent. You know what happened? I think one of the things that happens to us when we face failure, when things go wrong, we end up in the backside of the desert or we end up in a place of obscurity like Moses said, you know, when we, we lose our confidence, we, we lose our, our sense of worth or our sense of ability to do things. And, and then, of course, he's not honing his leadership skills to, to, to lead men and women and do all the things that he did in Egypt. He's, he's, he's a sheep herder. And he's, not that that's a bad thing. I'm just saying it's different than what he was doing, right? And, and he just feels like, man, I used to, I, I ain't got that anymore. I, I don't got that. I never did. The fact that his mind is that he never did. And that could happen to us. And so again, God reminded him, and he said to him, if I go back to that, what, Moses, what did I put in your hand? What is in your hand? What is in your hand? What is the staff? I'm talking to you now, I mean, as our calling. What's in your hand? What is in your hand is your uniqueness. What is in your hand is your personality. What is in your hand is so much more. What is in your hand? Yeah, but it's not the same as so-and-so. Good. Because so-and-so wasn't called to your people. Right? What is in your hand? It is uniqueness of who you are. We all feel this stuff. I remember uh, when I first started pastoring and I was 20 years old. I know what I do now. I would have told that guy he was too young. And uh, I started pastoring and Margaret and I did it back in service. And, uh, but I fell inadequately in my call. And, uh, God reminded me of a couple of verses, one in Jeremiah, but the one I want to quote is in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. And, and it became a very important verse to me in verse 26 and 27 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26, 27. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Brothers and sisters, Think of what you were when you were called. There's that word again. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. What's he saying? Those that won't rely on themselves. I chose those. It wasn't like Paul was a very talented man. But he chose those that did not rely on that. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of Egypt. He was a very eloquent man when he was 40. What happened several years later was he began to feel like he couldn't do it. And God says, finally now I can use you. Yeah. Finally now, it's not about you anymore. It's not about, it's not about you anymore, Moses. Now be a conduit of my power. Be a conduit of my life. And so that's what happened. And that's what will happen in your life. When you feel that, you are stronger than you've ever been in your life. When you feel that, you are, there is more potential anointing and power upon you. Because as Paul said in Corinthians, when you are weak, then you are strong, right? It is so true. So Moses experienced it. It's so deeply affected. So, so, so isn't it interesting? In the third verse in Exodus chapter 4, I, I, I kind of brushed over this and said I'd come back to it. But, but in, 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 in that verse, it says, 
that God said, take your staff and throw it on the ground. He throws it on the ground, it becomes a snake. What was Moses' reaction? He ran from it. He ran from it. He ran from his staff. He ran from it. That really hit me the other day when I was reading it. Isn't that interesting? He ran from his staff. We can run from the failures in our careers. We can run from divorces in our lives. We can run from the setbacks that we've had in our ministry. We can run from the, the things that have disillusioned the disappointments of it. We can run from those things. And when God puts his hand on it and says, that's your staff, let me flow through you in spite of all that or with all of that, we can run from it because we awaken something. And yet God says, I can use your staff. Don't run from me. Run to me. I have called you. Don't be afraid. Don't let failure dominate you. Don't say, I can't. Your can't lets you put you in a place where his I can can come into play. Your can't allows his can. Isn't that interesting? As it turned out, Moses was a very capable speaker. When he spoke God's word, it came with power. Read in Deuteronomy, the end of Deuteronomy, his magnificent farewell speech. At other times when he spoke, talked about power and eloquence and the ability to move a crowd and a nation. So what's that tell me? Jesus knows you better than you know yourself. Jesus knows you more than you know yourself. And he knows what he can unlock that's already in you. He knows what he can place in you as you move with him. Isn't that right? It's so true. And so finally then Moses, one more objection. The fifth one is in Exodus chapter 4 verse 13. And Moses finally cries out to God. And now we get down to it. And he says, please, just send somebody else. Leave me alone. Right? God loves you enough, loves you enough not to leave you alone. God loves you enough not to leave you alone. God loves you enough that it's not just about you. He loves the world enough to say, no, I'll not leave you alone because I put you here and I put stuff in you that this world needs. I've called you. I've called you. Isn't it interesting in all of these points God responded in this one, he responded differently. He became angry. He became angry. And then he said, well, there's Aaron. He's coming. You speak to Aaron and get him to say the words I tell him. And uh, it went that way. And, and Aaron wasn't always good. You know, like you know, there were times when Aaron blew it, right? Like, you know, Aaron's a guy, Moses is up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments and all the other laws and so forth, all the laws. There's 660 some of them. And so he's, he's, God's unpacking all that stuff. He's seeing the finger of God. He's just, he comes back, his face is glowing and so forth. And what's Aaron doing? He's building a golden calf, right? Uh, or another time in Numbers chapter 12 when Aaron and Miriam were critical of Moses' wife, right? All this kind of stuff. But I think he did need a comrade. He needed a friend. And we all need comrades. And we all need a friend. And one thing that was taken from us these last 15 months is the ability to connect beyond something that is virtual. Thank God for the virtual technology we have. But the ability to connect. And the ability to reach out with my hand and touch another human being and another friend or look at them in the eye and say, I'm there for you. You're my friend. And I believe in you. And God has called you. And God is using you. Isn't that right? Let us come back with that reality that we're here to spur one another on in an encouraging way 
Moses needed Aaron more than Aaron needed Moses in some ways. Moses needed a friend. Moses needed a friend. God said to him, you're the guy for your world, Moses. And I want to say to you, you're the guy, you're the gal for your world. We see the Lord's anger, his sense of passion for what he's put in you. I mean, he formed you in your mother's womb. He thought of you in the infinite time before that. He is working in your life now. And the thing that bothers him and upsets him is when we begin to reject the way he wired us, the way we ma he made us, and where he placed us and his desire to use us. Because his, that's his masterpiece. That's his work of art. You want to get an artist a little annoyed? You walk into their art gallery and in front of their face and start pulling apart the work they did. And so Moses is pulling apart the work that he did and he was going to do. And God, God was not impressed. Why? Because he's connected to that. He's connected to you. His calling is on you. His, you are his artwork. You are his tapestry. You are his child designed for the world in which you live. He wants to flow in you and through you. You, my friend, have a calling on your life. Let God unpack that to you. Let him, let him make it real. He'll get you there. Come into his presence. Let, like Moses did, just be with him and he'll help you do that. I want to pray for you this morning. It's a prayer from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 11. And I'm going to read it first and I'm going to pray it. If you're like me at all, somebody's going to pray if you want me to agree with it, if you'd like to know what that is. So it goes like this. Paul said to the church in Thessalonia, he said, So we keep praying for you, asking God to enable you to live a life worthy of his call. May he give you the power to accomplish all the good things your faith prompts you to do. 2 Thessalonians 1.11. I want to pray for you right now. That prayer that Paul prayed for the church in Thessalonica. Right now. Amen. Lord, may your anointing and your presence come upon us as we pray. So, I pray for you. I ask God to enable you to live a life worthy of his call. May he give you the power to accomplish all the good things your faith prompts you to do. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 God bless you. And thank you everybody for tuning in and, and watching us too from home. We're going to shut off the live stream now. And, and uh, we're going to, Miles is going to come up, he's got something first to say, and, uh, and then we'll shut that off. We'll open up the altars. If anybody wants prayer, you're welcome to have prayer this morning. So, but Miles has something here, so I want you to come up right now. Yeah. Um, well, before we turn off um, the iPad, I just, Sherry gave me a note here. It was a word for more vision that she saw while we were doing communion. And, I'm going to take a little bit of liberty with it because just based on the word that Stan uh, preached and what God was showing me when I read this, um, I'll read a bit of it. Uh, he said, I saw someone building with very large Lego blocks at the front of the altar. The structure was simple and lined up in rows. A very large circle of white light came down and covered the Lego bricks the person was working on. They kept building a little higher, a little bigger bricks. And again, and each time, the circle of light came and covered what was being built on the building. And they kept building with bigger bricks. And this kept going. And each time, the building was encouraged. And what I saw was there was two ways you could look at this. Moses, when he came to the burning bush, it was probably the most awesome altar that was ever on the earth. Yeah. But he came with all of the negative things in his life. Those were the bricks he was building with. 
So we can come to the altar and we can lay down the bricks and we can have all the excuses of why God can't use us or why we shouldn't be doing something or, or all of our regrets or whatever. And we bring them in here. Or they could be good bricks and all the things that you're doing for God and you're really making them successful. And like Sam was saying, when, when Moses laid down his, his staff, he ran from the snake. Some of us would think, well, that was pretty awesome. Like, that's a pretty big success. But we can run from our successes as well. Wow, wow, yeah. So one of or the two ways of looking at this was the fact that whether it's good bricks or bad bricks that you're building with, and you're coming to the altar, we get in the mindset that if it's bad bricks, that God is going to punish us. He's going to be angry with us. But, yeah. but in all things, God wants to encourage us. He wants us to be comfortable. But when we bring all our good bricks and we're building those things, it isn't to build something that we feel comfortable with in, and that we get comfortable in. God wants us to remain on the outside, like on the, on the fringe, where we're a little bit uncomfortable relying on him, that we don't get comfortable in that six or uh, whatever structure we end up building. So I just want to encourage you with that, before we pray with it, everybody, yeah. and for the people at home, um, hopefully that's both to you. And, yeah, that's good. And we want to pray for you. Thanks. That's good. Thank you, Miles.